right, good morning, everyone. I think because we've got four presenters this morning, we'll try to get things started relatively on time. Uh, so I'm gonna try to also, in the interest of time, just sort of introduce everyone right up front, uh, just because I want to make sure that uh, Lauren has time to talk about what she wants to talk about at the end and that she doesn't get cut short. So in the order that they are presenting, we have Ryan Constantine here, uh, who is one of our own here from the University of Utah. He's uh, an MD, PhD, and he's gonna be talking about UNC 119, which does not stand for University of North Carolina, I just learned, but it stands for uncoordinated, which is quite different. Um, we have Christina Lippi from Penn State, uh, who will be speaking next. She's a big Nittany Lion fan. Don't mention Joe Paterno in her presence. She gets angry. Um, and then Max Padilla, another one of our own, will be speaking after that. And then we have Lauren Imbornoni from the University of Arizona. Uh, she seems to like both Arizona and Arizona State, so you won't make her angry by mentioning either one of those schools. So those are our presenters this morning, and uh, we'll let Ryan get started. So in response to that, I will do my best to cram about four years of research into 10 to 15 minutes here. Um, as Dr. Bell just said, uh, UNC actually stands for uncoordinated because it was uh, the protein was initially um, identified in C. elegans in which it was knocked out. The worm became uncoordinated and was an unable to localize and find food. Um, I'm going to talk about UNC-119 UNC in response to its effect in rods, more specifically mouse than anything, uh, and how it affects trafficking. So to orient ourselves first, we're just gonna look at photoreceptor cells. Here's a schematic of a rod. We have the outer segment, the inner segment. Outer segment houses all of the phototransduction machi machinery. Phototransduction, obviously, as most of us know here, is the process by which we convert light into an electrical signal. Uh, the inner segment houses all the biosynthetic machinery. It makes all the proteins that are used in photo phototransduction, which then have to be transported through a connecting cilium into this outer segment. We look at this blown up area of an outer segment, we see all these membranous disks. These are the disks that house the phototransduction machi machinery. These cells are exceedingly biosynthetically active in that each of these disks is renewed every 10 days. They move in this sort of vertical fashion, so on day one, this disk is newly formed. By day 10, it's up here at the distal end. It's phagocytosed by the retinal pigment epithelium cells. Uh, and it's all renewed, including all the proteins involved. So it's a really biosynthetically active cell. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is a lot of these phototransduction components are membrane associated. And while there's a whole slew of proteins involved in this cascade, I want you to really just focus on transducin for the purpose of this talk. Transducin in the dark consists as a heterotrimer with an alpha subunit bound to GDP and a beta subunit and a gamma subunit. Uh, in response to light, rhodopsin is activated, causes transducin to dissociate into an alpha subunit and a beta gamma subunit, and then it also dis translocates or swaps GDP for GTP. Um, you see here, either most, most of these proteins are either integral membrane proteins or membrane associated. Membrane association happens with prenyl moieties, either a farnesyl or a geronal geronal, or acyl moieties, either laurel or myristoyl. Um, in the case of transducin, the alpha subunit has an acyl moiety on it in order to tag it into the membrane. The, the gamma subunit is prenylated to, to tag it into the membrane. So keep that in mind. And when it's a heterotrimer with both of those lipid moieties inserted into the membrane, it's very difficult to remove that. Um, one of the significant tra trafficking pro procedures uh, that takes place in these cells is something called light-driven translocation. In the case of transducin, when the rod cells are in the dark, all 80 to 90% of transducin is located in the outer segment. In response to light, all that transducin is driven to the inner segment. And so this was sort of this, one of these unknown sort of biological processes and what we were actually studying. The interesting thing is when this process, when light hits these rods, it takes about five minutes for 80 to 90% of transducin to be driven to the inner segment. However, to return to the outer segment in response to return to the dark, it takes three hours. So the question was, why is there this difference? 
And what is the, the mechanism behind this? Is it active transport? Probably not, because active transport is one dimensional. It's done by molecular motors. One dimensional active transport would be overwhelmed by the amount of transducin that needs to be transported in this amount of time. So we, are pr our, we were believing that it was diffusion, and we were under trying to understand why and how this actually takes place. This was sort of an unresolved question in photoreceptor trafficking biology. This is just an example in Xenopus. If you look at these rods in the dark, we're standing for transducin. In response to light, you see that it goes to the inner segment. So one of the uh, proteins that our lab had studied um, was a protein called PDE delta. And this is a known prenyl binding protein. So some old data from the lab before I started, we look at a PDE delta knockout mouse. You can see in wild type, it stains very nicely here in the outer segments. Um, when we take the knockout, you can see a lot of the staining is now found in the inner segments, indicating that there was this some problem with transport after the biosynthesis of, in this case, PDE. So we, this is a known prenyl binding protein, but if we look at uh, cone T gamma, we see that in the PDE knockout, and remember that gamma is prenylated, it seems to be transported just fine, trafficked from inner segment to outer segment without a problem, okay? So there must be some other uh, prenyl binding protein that we don't know about. If we look quickly, you can, this is a structure of PDE delta, it's got this beta sandwich fold with this kind of cavity in the middle. When we overlay it with another known pre PD or prenyl binding protein called BroGDI with this prenyl moiety in its pocket, you can see that this pocket can accommodate a prenyl binding protein. So the question is, why do some proteins make it from inner segment after biosynthesis to outer segment, but others don't, even though they're also prenyl, have prenyl moiety? So we looked for a new binding candidate, and we aligned a protein that we were interested in called UNC119, with PD delta, and in this alignment, we see that they're 30% similar. And if we also look at this dendrogram, we can see that they're also biologically related. Here we see PD, UNC119, another protein, UNC119D, which we're not gonna talk about today. But they are biologically related if we follow the dendrogram back. So we found this protein, UNC119, we were interested in studying. So we did a simple protein pull down. We used GFT tagged human UNC119. We ground up a whole bunch of mouse retina and we identified this new band, sent it off for mass spec. Mass spec identified this band as transducin alpha. Keep in mind, transducin alpha is acylated, not prenylated. However, the transducin gamma subunit is prenylated, like I mentioned. So do we know if we have the heterotrimer or if we have the dissociated transducin alpha or beta gamma? To identify if we were interacting with the alpha subunit or the gamma subunit, we did another pull down, probed for transducin alpha. Here's our GST UNC119, and here we identified that we're interacting with the alpha subunit. Probed for transducin gamma, we don't see anything. So most likely UNC119 seems to be interacting with the alpha subunit in the acyl, the acyl moiety that it's attached to. Um, then we took a transducin alpha knockout mouse to further identify uh, if we were accurate, and you see in the al alpha knockout, we're not pulling down transducin alpha, obviously. We're still not pulling down gamma, um, which identifies that UNC119 does appear to be interacting with the alpha subunit between these two experiments. In order for these proteins to be isolated, they need a glycine at position two. We mutated that glycine to an alanine, repeated the pull down, doesn't act. So that goes to show that that acyl moiety is important. It needs to be there. Then we were wondering what the interaction was like. Since it's a lipid, uh, lipid tail interacting with UNC119 as we expected, we thought we might be able to disrupt it. Here, we're showing the interactin, SC interaction. SC389 is the antibody for transducin alpha. UNC119 interacts with transducin alpha. We add detergent, which interacts or interrupts lipid interactions we no longer see that interaction. So we were pretty confident at that point that we had a lipid interaction. Furthermore, we made a synthetic laurelated, these are the first 10 residues of transducin alpha, peptide. We added it into our pull down. Now we're not seeing the interaction with transducin alpha, and that's because we added so much excess of this, we were able to outcompete the endogenous interaction with transducin alpha. Furthermore, to quantify the binding capacity and the and the dissociation constant, um, we took the same peptide with either the laurel or myristoil. Laurel is 12 carbons, myristoil is 14. And we used something called iso isothermal titration calorimetry. Don't worry about the blue line right now. And we see a really nice binding curve showing that UNC119 will interact with these synthetic peptides. 
in the absence of the lipid tail, we see a flat line indicating no interaction. While this was going on, over the course of about three years and I would say greater than 10,000 crystallization con conditions, uh, we were able to actually crystallize. This is UNC-119 and we see the same beta sandwich fold. And inside, green is the laurel tail of translucent alpha and in gray, we have those first 10 re residues. So we co-crystallized that synthetic peptide in the UNC-119 cavity. This does shows beautifully how this lipid tail inserts into that cavity and the rest of transducent sort of spins out in a um, alpha helical fashion. Um, interestingly, the binding pocket showed these strange charged residues, glutamate 163, histidine 165, and histidine 192. And we didn't understand why there were charged residues in what we thought was a lipid binding pocket. And it turns out when we were able to look uh, very specifically at this um, binding pocket, that they limit the depth to which the acyl chain can actually penetrate that pocket. And they're there forming, forming this very intricate uh, hydrogen bonding network, um, which provides the specificity for uh, acyl groups as opposed to prenyl groups. Um, then the question was, is GTP and UNC-119 necessary for the binding? And so we repeated this pl these pull-down experiments using mouse retina, and we show here that in the presence of UNC-119 and GTP, only are we able to pull down transducent alpha. Furthermore, we repeated the experiment in light adapted and dark adapted because we wanted to know if we were pulling down the alpha subunit or the alpha subunit in combination with the, beta the full heterotrimer, which we would see in the dark. We don't see that. We see we're only pulling down the alpha subunit in the light after dissociation. We were able to use this in this experiment. We used um, a radioactive GTPase assay. And this was important because transducent alpha doesn't hydrolyze GTP in the absence of rhodopsin, which is its guanine exchange factor. However, there is a minimal amount of activity, and so we depleted rod outer segment membra membranes from bovine retina, basically washed everything away from them, and then we reconstituted the system and saw how GTP was hydrolyzed. So when we add the heterotrimer back to rod outer segments in the presence of uh, rhodopsin, because we aren't unable to wash that away since it's an integral membrane protein, we see that GTP gets hydrolyzed over a slow period of time. However, when we add UNC-119 back into the system, it's inhibiting it. Lastly, to sort of get at this question that I mentioned earlier about this rate difference, and we made a knockout mouse. We have the UNC-119 knockout mouse. We dark adapted, which means we expect transducin to be all in the outer segment. We see that here in the wild type mouse. In the knockout, there's obviously a little bit in the inner segments, things are a little bit different. Then we took these mice and we shined bright light on them, their, their retinas for an hour, put them back in the dark. At time zero, you can see that in response to light, a lot of transducin gets shuttled back into the inner segment. After three hours, it's slowly in the dark, it's slowly returning to the outer segment. After six, it's almost completely there. However, in the knockout, even after 24 hours, we're still seeing um, transducin in the inner segment. So we're basically able to take our interaction data, develop our model in vitro, then use an animal model to sort of identify and recapitulate all of this data. So basically we've come up with this sort of light-induced translocation model of transducin in which in response to light we have the transducin heterotrimer, GTP gets exchanged for GDP, it dissociates, these now that it's dissociated, it's easier to, dis to pull these out of membranes. They get transported into the inner segment, recombine on any membrane really that's available, although we don't know exactly, but we assume endoplasmic reticulum is available to do this, Golgi is available to do this. Now in the inner segment, in the absence of rhodopsin, which is the guanine exchange factor that I mentioned, GTP gets exchanged for GDP, or gets hydrolyzed to GDP. This happens, transducin can do this alone, but it does so very slowly, on the order of about three hours, which is what we saw in those mouse experiments. When this dissociates in, a, in response to that exchange, UNC-119 can then come, and it basically acts as a chaperone, protecting this acyl chain, which is unfavorable out in the aqueous environment of the cell, and transporting it back to the outer segment so the whole process can happen again. Um, with that, just wanted to thank people that have helped Wolfgang Bear's lab, which is on the south side of the building. I work 
did a lot of the crystallography with Chris Hill in biochemistry. <coughs> um, my thesis committee was instrumental. Northeast Structural Genomics helped with some of the crystallization. The Moran Eye Center was instrumental in some of the funding. Uh, Stanford was actually where we collected our crystallography data on their synchrotron. Um, and then the graduate program here. I'm happy to take questions. I know I flew through that uh, in the interest of time, but hopefully you found it interesting and it was convincing. Thank you. Questions? Anyone? Is it clinically relevant? That's what you all want to know, probably. We don't know, unfortunately. Um, there has been one patient identified with a mutation in UNC119 who has a late onset rod dystrophy. Uh, the protein's relatively new. I think at this point, no one has really done a lot of genotyping of patients to really know. Um, so it sort of remains to be seen. And I know that's probably more interesting than what most of you, but we'll see. Cool scientific problem. All right. Move on to the next person. What you're getting is lack of questions. Maybe it's just nobody can address the challenge that you're presenting. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's, it's hard. It's different being told. Sure. Well, and it's hard to go through four years of work in 10 to 15 minutes.